as you're able. And join me, not join me, but hear these words from the book of Acts. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Friends, please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious sovereign and our God, assist me to proclaim, to spread to all the world abroad the honors and glories of thy name. Amen. What do you do while you're waiting? What do you do while you're waiting? How many of you have ever waited in traffic? Anybody? Recently, yeah, it can be kind of rough. What do you do while you're waiting? Do you have a podcast or radio show or something you can do to pass your time? Do you call loved ones and communicate with them to stay in touch? Do you make good use of waiting or do you let it pass by? I mean, how many of you have ever been stuck somewhere where you aren't able to go on your journey or get to the next place and you find yourself away from home in a place you didn't want to be all by yourself there in this place, not knowing what's going on around you? Have you ever been stuck? I heard stories this week as I asked people that question of people who got stuck on vacation. The best one I heard this week was someone who told me about having to spend an extra three days in Hawaii. I mean, throw me into that briar patch, right? But I heard others about people not being able to be in touch with family or challenges or fear because they were stuck somewhere all by themselves. 
And in this story today, we might easily pass by it telling us in that very first verse that somehow Paul is waiting on them to return, but we don't quite understand what that means unless we look back and read it. You see, Paul has been called by Jesus to go out into the world to the Gentiles and share with them the good news. The book of Acts records all of these different places and times that he went out and shared the message of Jesus. And so far in our story where we get to this point in Acts, he has been up to Philippi and there got in trouble where they tried to beat him and drag him before the Bema. Afraid for his life, some fellow Christians got him out of there and took him up to Thessaloniki. There in Thessaloniki, he has also been again in some trouble as those kind of arguments go about what to believe and why to believe and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And to save his life and get him out of danger, they've now taken him down to Athens. And we're told that Silas and Timothy have left Paul in Athens, and he is waiting for, Paul, for them to return. And it's why it kind of begs the question, what do you do while you're waiting? Because what we're told Paul does is Paul, while he's waiting there in Athens, goes into the most public place he can find and starts telling people about Jesus, the Messiah, who is risen from the dead. So I guess what you do while you're waiting depends on the clarity you have about who you are about who's in your life, about the mission and purpose that God has given you. And what we see from these earliest followers of Jesus, that in the most unexpected ways, those earliest followers of Jesus, just in that wake of Easter, go out into the world and they thrived. It was truly amazing what God did in their midst. Because friends, I don't know if you can kind of wrap your mind around this, but Paul walks into the equivalent of Rice University, if we're gonna put it in the Houston context, begins teaching just out in the square probably out by the stadium as people are coming and going. I guess nowadays they go to basketball more, maybe the baseball stadium. Is that where all the the stuff's going there at Rice? But like there by the baseball stadium, and he's not talking about curveballs. He's talking about faith and kind of an understanding of the world. And all the professors stop, pay attention, and want to know more about it. I was blessed to go to this place in the ancient world of ancient Greece there in Athens. And here's a picture of Laura and I on the Acropolis with the Parthenon behind us. And when you're up in this place with the Parthenon, um, that is not a small model. That's the real thing at a distance, okay? We're a pretty good walk from it right there. It's massive. It's, it's uh, easily longer, uh, about the same height as the, the church is. It's a massive building and structure. And there, when you're kind of looking on that, if you look kind of in front of us, down and a little bit further over to the right, there's a place called Mars Hill. Now, they didn't call it Mars Hill in today's text because the people writing it were Greek, and they called it the Aragoapus, which means kind of mountain that the god Ares was supposed to be worshipped on and followed on. And so it's, it's in Roman times, that same guy was known as Mars. So Mars Hill, yes, that's who the planet is named after, or if you have a different feeling, that is the way a Mars bar is named right? So anyway, right there on on Mars Hill. But the thing that happens there on this hill that you can see, that's now you're on Mars Hill, you're looking back up at the Acropolis, and yes, I did take this picture as well, I just didn't 
put us in it. But as you kind of look back up at the uh, Acropolis, you actually know what's, what's kind of up there. The Parthenon is further in the back. That's the entrance to it there. But over on the right, uh, how many of y'all have ever heard of Nike? right? Thanks to the people up in Port, uh, Portland, right? Nike uh, was, a, was a Greek god that was worshipped as the god of victory, and, and the temple to Nike is that kind of stuff over on the, the right side of the Acropolis. But there on Mars Hill, you can see how rocky it is in this picture. There on Mars Hill, there would be a group of Athenians that met regularly as kind of the city council and judicial court and all the learned people of the day. And they would meet in that place with clarity about what's going on in the city. So when we read today's text and we're told that Paul is asked by these professors to come up to the hill and to tell them what he's teaching, it could sound kind of benevolent, like, hey, Pastor Brad, would you come tell my friend about Jesus? Wouldn't that be great? Right? But that would be without them telling me that, oh yeah, and we want you to come to the courthouse and there's going to be a hearing. Like that's what's going on here. Paul is being brought up to Mars Hill to be investigated or interrogated over whether or not he's teaching new teachings. Now, I know for some of us, that's like, okay, Pastor Brad, this is like ancient history and stuff like that. But there's another guy you heard of. How many of y'all have heard of Socrates? Right? Anybody know what he was killed for? Bringing new teachings to the youth. Paul is being brought to the place where Socrates was tried and decided to be put to death, to be put on trial for his life all because he was waiting, all because he was brought to this place to be safe with no kind of theological plan, no idea about what God might do, but all that he knew is that in his soul, the truth of the resurrected Savior and the difference God's love through Jesus could make in the world could not be contained, so he could never shut up about it. And so he went into the most public place with the most learned people and there shared with them the love of God. And now he's going to be tried for it. There in that beautiful hill, you can see also down into the valley the temple of Hephaestus and the Stoa. Okay, and what's fascinating is, so here you are on the hill, and in the next picture, I hope they have the next picture, there you go, Um, you can look down, and there you can kind of see the two, and over on the left is the large temple there, named after Hephaestus, he was a metal worker who did great things, and it was so that you and your business, it was really kind of cool, you know, you could go to that temple, and if you gave the right offering and made the right sacrifice, the promise was this God would just take care of everything you wanted. Your business would be prosperous. Isn't that cool? Like a very transactional God, right? And then over here on the right is the Stoa, where the Stoics were in this big, long kind of colonnade of places where people taught and practiced what might be called Stoicism. And and the reason kind of both are brought in here in these pictures that you can see from Mars Hill is that it makes more sense in the speech that Paul gives when he names two types of followers of the Greek traditions and the little g gods. He says, this group and that group. But you have to understand, he's looking out at their places that are the center of their thought. And so he's literally calling on each one. Now, what catches us by surprise is that he actually not only references them, but quotes their primary philosophers back to the Greeks. Like, how do you do that? I mean, maybe I'm getting this all wrong. He's waiting, he's excited to talk about Jesus, 
But I thought to talk about Jesus, I had to make other people wrong. I mean, to talk about Jesus and to tell people about the love Jesus has in your life, don't, doesn't that mean that other people lose something? Doesn't mean that, that, that they get to be less them? Isn't it about conflict or getting an issue where you're going to make a point and you're going to somehow tear down their philosophy or group, right? Isn't that what following Jesus and teaching people to follow Jesus is? But here somehow Paul had spent so much time there listening to people in the marketplace and had had such an education and knowledge that he was able to speak out of their own tradition in a way that called them forward into the possibilities of what Jesus might do in what they believe. He wasn't there on a corner with a blowhorn and whistle, yelling out at people and telling them that they were all going to need to turn or burn. It wasn't like the preaching I heard sometimes growing up that was really assault by attempt to preach. Instead, what he did was shared the love that Jesus had made in his life and how through even the Greek tradition, God's will was being made known and revealed even to the Gentile. And he says, you have a place where you worship this unknown God. I read a lot about that. There's been a lot of scholarly work done on this unknown God and people trying to figure out, was it talking about a God or a a specific place, a specific, you know, something in uh, archaeology that could be found and discovered? But what turns out is that in the practice of ancient Greece, they were so worried about not offending one of the pantheon of gods that what they would do is they would make a sacrifice at an altar that they would name to the unknown God to kind of cover the one they might have missed. And what Paul does is he says, you know that sensitivity in your soul that is seeking something spiritual but hasn't been satiated or allowed to really flourish or bloom, that thing that knows that there is a God and that somehow what we're doing isn't quite covering all the bases. It is fulfilled in the love and grace of Jesus Christ who is coming to draw the world into righteousness, not through hatred and anger, but through love, through forgiveness, through grace. Needless to say, it's an important message that we need to think about today because we live in a world that seems to have lost its way. This January, the Pew study put out an annual research uh, report Uh, It's from the Pew Pew Research Center report this January. Um, They listed that according to them, 28% of Americans reported having no religious affiliation. Now, that's actually good because that's down from 31% before the pandemic. Okay, so apparently people found God a little more specifically during the pandemic. All right, But of those 28%, what I want to let you know, according to Pew, is that four in five are either agnostic, where they clearly know they don't know what they don't know, or believe that there is a God of something, but they don't observe religious practice. These are the people that will tell you, I'm spiritual, but not religious, as if you could be such a thing. But what I want to point out to you is that if you just run the numbers on the American population, that means that we have this huge group of people in this country, about 67 million, who are open to God, but they've closed the door to religious practice. I wonder... Do we need to be reliving out 
Paul's message on Mars Hill over and over again? Do we need to be so clear about God's love in our lives and what Jesus has done that has made the difference to redeem us in his grace that perhaps we can approach the rest of the world not in judgment, not in anger, but in a love that makes possible what God can do. You see, I believe that clarity that we're given at Easter gives the followers of Jesus an ability to love people into the possibilities of all God has for them. And that if we're to be followers of Jesus, somehow we have to allow allow that love to so wash our hearts and cleanse our lives that while we are waiting, we can't help but make use of the time we have to share the blessing of Jesus. Because, friends, the story of Easter is that Jesus has gone somewhere we can't and one day will return to bring about the redemption of the world. Friends, all of us are waiting. Clarity about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in our lives allows the love of Jesus to let those beautiful possibilities be made fully known. What will we do with this time of waiting, this time between, this time before Jesus again takes the throne? Oh, friends, I pray, will be Jesus's ambassadors of love with clarity about his redeeming grace, empowering us to go into an uncertain world and love them into the possibilities of all God might do. Amen.